Today on The Global African, we'll give an update on Baltimore. We'll also talk about the parallels between the great migration of African Americans and immigration today. That's Today in The Global African. I'm your host, Bill Fletcher. Thanks for joining us, and don't go anywhere. Between the years of 1910 and 1970, around 7 million African Americans escaped the Jim Crow South and made their way up to northern cities. This period is referred to as the Great Migration, and through this massive movement, African Americans hoped to obtain way more than just their freedom. They were pursuing opportunity as well. It can be said that the immigrants today are chasing the same things. What are the similarities and differences between the Great Migration and immigration today? That's what we're going to be exploring in this segment. We're joined for this segment with Dr. Marsha Chetlin, who is a Georgetown professor, researches a wide array of issues in African American history. She writes and teaches about African American migration and is the author of this book, South Side Girls, which looks at growing up in the Great Migration, which is where we're going to start. Thank you for joining us. Thank you. The Great Migration. Many viewers will maybe have heard of this. Mm -hmm. What was the Great Migration? The Great Migration was a critical movement of between six and seven million African Americans, roughly between 1917 and 1970. And it's essentially a mass exodus of people who are seeking better jobs, better opportunities for their children, especially their daughters, and, and that's what I capture in my book, and an opportunity to really realize their citizenship, which was not possible in the Jim Crow South. You know, one of the things that's uh, perplexing for many people is that the conditions for African Americans in the South were so hostile uh, that one would wonder, well, why was there any resistance by whites in the South to African Americans leaving? Absolutely. This is a really interesting thing when we look at the migration that newspapers like the Chicago Defender, which had advertisements for African Americans to get jobs in the North, it's banned in certain cities. Job recruiters are banned from coming into some parts of the South. Uh, movement is criminalized. And I think it has, there's two reasons for it. One, I think that there's white supremacy at that time is all about control and power. Mm -hmm. And so it would be on those terms, right, that are set forth by people in the South, that's how people can leave. So I think it's a power and control thing. But the second thing also is that the mass exodus helped highlight the conditions in the South because now we have a population of people who are once isolated, who are disconnected from media, who are able to move to the North and tell their stories about that, you know, the rule of law is not being respected, the way that the KKK and the police are in cahoots and terrorizing African Americans. And so, in a sense, the South was really invested in showing that things are just fine, our blacks are good, they're happy here, they're not going to move, and we can't expose what's really happening to the rest of the world. I mean, that not there a third factor, which is that uh, this was having an effect on the southern economy? In other words, that, that black workers were needed in the southern economy, although, as you point out, there was a crisis in agriculture. Well, so this is a this is a tough one, right? Because sharecropping is essentially slavery mm -hmm. um, for African Americans, and so that system of labor is necessary. But when after the boll weevil infestation of cotton crops, and then you have the mechanization of the cotton picker, mm -hmm. you don't need the bodies, but you do need the. Um, political economy of an oppressed group that you can do whatever you want with in terms of labor. And so the question is, if the African Americans leave and you have poor whites doing this, this job, their whiteness is going to ultimately, right, upend this economic system that blacks fit mm -hmm. into. So mm -hmm. you're absolutely right that there is a labor concern, but again, it's so deeply tied into the system of white supremacy in the South. One of the things that I, over the years, found interesting about the migration was that the migration followed certain very definite patterns. So if you lived east of Alabama, basically, you seem to move straight up the coast. Uh, Alabama, Mississippi, Arkansas, you straight up the Mississippi. Mm -hmm. And then you had a separate migration that becomes more important during World War II out of uh, Arkansas and Texas that goes due west. 
Um, but you, you see these lines mm -hmm. that, that play out. And what's amazing, so a lot of these lines are carved out because of train travel, right? Mm -hmm. These are the routes that people can go to. But what starts to happen is when people are migrating um, in significant numbers from the same town, they're getting back the same people from those towns and they're recreating those communities in the cities. And so when you look at African Americans in Chicago, they have such deep ties to Mississippi that you know, there are situations where entire church congregations pick up and they leave together and they reopen in Chicago. So I think that the story of migration is about disruption and continuity. Mm -hmm. And in the book and in my various engagements with migration history, I love the way that that creates a tension for people. Because part of the pull of migration is to recreate yourself in a new context, yeah. but then the nostalgia and the homesickness sets in. And so as girls are navigating these changes, they're also in a community that's trying to decide whether they want to leave the South behind entirely or if they actually miss the South and it's somewhere in the middle. The uh, beginning in 1917, there is race riots mm -hmm. that uh, follow certain patterns. So. Uh, where you see migrants like East St. Louis, and then eventually in 1919, we have Red Summer. Um, talk about that. Well, I think it's interesting that these, that these violent eruptions are often contestations about public space. And mm -hmm. I think that in this moment, right, we mm -hmm. know um, the tensions about hyper-policing, about access to public space, about access to resources, and this idea of who's really a citizen and who gets to benefit from it, right? All of this is happening during this time where you have these lines that are um, drawn between black and white and any time there's a slight crossing of it or an, even an idea that someone might have crossed it, violence erupts. Mm. And you don't have um, a police force that can protect citizens in those situations. So all hell breaks loose. And so these violent uprisings are about um, beaches. They're about parks. They're about rumors of you know, sexual relationships across the color line. It's all about this idea about whose space is this and who gets to claim it and who owns it. And so these, um, these confrontations continue to be part of the northern urban landscape in ways that migrants don't know how to make sense of because they were seeking freedom to begin with. Tell us about the book. Oh gosh, this book. Yeah. Um, this book is about the experiences of girls and young women who are grappling with all of these issues in the Great Migration. And I start with these girls who write letters to Robert Ad Abbott of the Chicago Defender, and they say, send me a train ticket, give me a lead on a job because there is nothing for me here in the South. And it also includes parents who are saying to themselves, I want my daughter to be a child. I don't want her working in white folks' kitchen starting at the age of eight or nine, which was a common practice for girls to spend the whole summer with a white family to train to be a domestic. They say, I don't want that for my daughter. This is about families trying to understand what a childhood can be for a population where there are questions whether a, a black girl can actually be raped. There are questions. Wait a minute, there's a debate there's about. There's a debate about this. So in the late 19th century, a lot of white women's civic organizations are trying to raise the age of sexual consent. Right. And among these conversations about how to um, create a protected category sexually, there's a question of race. And the question is, if an age of consent law applies to a white girl, can it also apply to a black girl? And so in state legislatures throughout the South, people are entering expert testimony that in fact, you know, the, of the Negro race, um, you know, a, the girl becomes a woman at age nine. So she can't be raped. And one of the reasons why these laws are put in place, this is a labor issue. African-American women know that their daughters are going into households unattended at a very young age. And they want to have some type of legal recourse in case one of the men in the house attacks their daughters, right? right. So this is the context in which migration is also happening. The story of the Great Migration, we were talking about this a little earlier. Uh, when I, I, I was familiar with it for a long time, but in the 90s, there was this sort of short documentary I saw called Up South that focused on a migration from Mississippi to Chicago by, uh, by this family. And after it was over, I, I said, wow, 
This sounds like Salvadorans. This sounds like Hondurans. This sounds like Haitians. This sounds like Dominicans. And, and uh, what I'm hearing here resonates. It's, it's not like it, it's, it just felt very, very uh, in sync. And I was curious, when you were doing this research, did you have that same kind of aha moment? Right. So a lot of the themes of this story are so applicable to the immigrant communities that are, you know, throughout the United States. You have these dire situations that are pulling people, you know, out of their um, places of birth and say, you know, we don't know what's on the other side, but something's got to be better. Mm -hmm. You have this experience of putting children in schools where they don't fit in. You know, Southern kids, when they go to Northern schools, the Northern black children make fun of them. They don't fit in. They talk different. They dress different. And throughout the book, there's all of these um, situations where girls are just trying to fit in, right? Mm. Um, there's one girl, she sends a letter to Eleanor Roosevelt and says, you know, Mrs. Roosevelt, just send me some clothes so I can fit in with these city kids. That's all I want to do, you know? Mm. And so you have those tensions, but you also have the tension of those generation of children who then adapt um, and adopt the practices of their new home. And the parents are upset about that, right? Things have changed. And you also have a labor situation in which newcomers are easily exploited. Mm -hmm. They're pit against other groups of people, right? Um, in Chicago, during this period, you know, scab labor is often black women. That's, and yeah. they are, you know, susceptible to all sorts of racialized and gendered violence as a result of them trying to kind of fit into this economy, right? And they're considered pliable workers. Um, and so all of these things that, you know, these, these ridiculous debates about immigration that we currently have to endure, mm -hmm. people are having the same ridiculous conversations about internal migration. And I think at the end of the day, what we see is what happens when, you know, um, groups of people become concerned about these issues, the way that they interact with newcomer communities. Sometimes they do it really well and reflectively. Sometimes they do a bad job because it's all about assimilation. Mm -hmm. And, you know, one of the things that really resonated with me as I was finishing this book is what happens to migrant girls when they're unaccompanied, mm. when, they are, when they don't have parents anymore, their parents have died on the journey or after coming to Chicago, and I couldn't help but think about the unaccompanied minors, right? right? A little kid by themselves in an unfamiliar territory and what that requires us all to really think about and how it challenges our current system of child protection, it challenges our relations with other nations, it challenges our ideas about what children can and cannot do. And so I think that, you know, if anything, I hope this work really speaks to those communities that also go through the growing pains of an enormous amount of change that's all undergirded by so much hope and so much possibility. Let me ask one more question. Mm -hmm. You talked about the similarities. What are the differences? Mm -hmm. Well, I mean, the first one is the language barrier. And this is one of the reasons why black migrants were considered such a great workforce. You didn't have to worry about language barriers when you brought them into the factories in the north the way you did with um, recent immigrants. The thing that I also think is interesting when we talk about, you know, again, these ideas when people try to set up, you know, why can't blacks do this because immigrants can? The respect for the vote, right? Mm. So we have populations in this country who are deeply disenfranchised. And then we have populations that, are, that get the vote the second that they come to this country, right? right? And so I think those tensions about how does a critical mass of people who are so important to the economy and then are shut out from the political processes, like voting, right, that can help determine their destiny, I think are some of the things that we think of, we can think about in terms of the differences about respect for, for voting and citizenship. And I think that the critical difference is that um, we're in a moment that I think that there is a respect for indigenous culture to an extent because of the infrastructure of organizations that are working with people. I think that we are more or less past a point where, um, you know, that groups can kind of find each other and try to create a critical mass. The question is, how do we have the policies and the political will to make sure that this critical mass is respected and treated fairly? And so I think that, you know, 
I, I loved working on this project. I love the questions that it opens up, not just about immigration and migration, but policing, mm -hmm. community, safety for all citizens. And I think it just demonstrates the power of history to always speak uh, to the present. Dr. Marsha Chetlin, thank you very much for joining us for The Global African. Thank you. And thank you for joining us for this segment of The Global African. I'm your host, Bill Fletcher, and we'll be back in a moment, so don't go anywhere. The death of Freddie Gray spiked nationwide attention and shed yet more light on his country's issue with police brutality. Folks took to the streets in protest, wanting to see an end to police violence. However, while the six officers involved in the murder of Freddie Gray have been charged, violence in the city has worsened. It has been a month since the uprisings and the murder toll, as well as the number of shootings, is at an all-time high here in Baltimore. In the month of May alone, the city recorded 43 murders and 219 non-fatal shootings. While much has been made of the police violence that triggered this wave of protests, the uprisings are surely the result of centuries of state-sponsored oppression. So here is the question. How do we move the fight for racial justice beyond the fight around police violence? That's the question that we're going to explore in this segment of The Global African. Joined for this discussion with Robert Bob Moore, who served as the International Vice President of the Service Employees International Union, SEIU, from 1990 to 2008. He joined uh, Local 1199, SEIU, Baltimore's organizing campaign in 1969, and prior to that served as the Maryland Director of the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee during the period prior to the 1968 assassination of Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King. Also joining us is Adam Jackson, the CEO of Leaders of a Beautiful Struggle. Adam is a West Baltimore native, a Towson University graduate. He was also a nationally ranked college debater and previously taught debate to high school and middle school students. Welcome to The Global African. Thank you. Thank you for having me. Uh, now, the issue that I've been wondering about is the extent to which this movement has the potential to morph into a broader racial and economic justice movement, or do you think that it is destined to remain focused on the issue of racist violence and the police? Um, <clears throat> well, I would hope that it doesn't stay there, that it does focus on uh, these other issues because of uh, jobs and education, because uh, that's at the center of what's mainly wrong, I think, the, the fact that people cannot really take care of themselves, don't look for a great life, and so get caught up. And the police are just uh, uh, rampant on what they have been taught to do and believe about uh, black people and and crime. Yeah, yeah I, guess, uh, I guess in terms of uh, when we look at the uh, recent killings of unarmed black people over the past uh, few years, you know, I think that one thing that's important to understand in context is that it's not like this is the first time that black folks have been unjustly targeted by police and murdered. And so what, what's happened is that, is that media outlets have figured out that there's an incentive for them covering the murder and death of black people and black, and, uh, you know, black death. But I think that when people talk about Black Lives Matter as a thing, you know, to me that's like that's that's media using the nice package of of saying that you know there's a this is this is the this is the first time this has happened. This is the first time this has become a major issue. When you know lynchings of black people in the in the early 1900s, that was already an issue, and now we just switch from lynchings to police killings of black people. You, Adam, said that we have to uh, organize to gain power. Now, behind those words can mean, can be any kind of different strategy. 
Well, I can I can speak to ba what Baltimore has been doing, the trends in Baltimore. Mm -hmm. The tendencies in Baltimore is that we latch on to institutions that already have power, influence, money, what have you, and then we expect to to ascend in these institutions and then to gain power after we get into elected office or other positions of power within you know either agencies, or organizations, and what have you that are already established. And I think that's a you know that's a misguided and you know it's a it's a misguided attempt at actually getting power because the people who have the power or the institutions that have the power are not us. We don't have it. They have it because we're aspiring to be involved in what they already have set up. And so I think that's what happens in Baltimore. You have democratic clubs, you have unions, you have churches, you have the current political infrastructure. People aspire to be a part of you know, what's already happening. And so to me, I mean, there's a lot of different uh, methodologies and strategies. But if you're talking about um, other ways to organize the game power, I know with LBS and the stuff that we do, from our perspective, when we first started, there, there weren't any think tanks in Baltimore that focused on what black people needed. And so if we formed a think tank that did that, then that's going to add something to, that's going to add another tool to the toolbox that people can have access to. Mm -hmm. But I think there are other areas of life too that people can do that with. I think that you talk about food, uh, food, uh, food sustainability with Heber, Reverend Heber Brown. He is, he bought land and is, and is growing food in West Baltimore and wants to create a food system for black people in West Baltimore and eventually going to West Baltimore. So that to me, those are real simple things that people can do to build for self. Um, well, you know, in part, I think uh, Adam's right, at least in the focus that you got to build uh, some kind of organization and movement that's not directly tied to the institutions you want to change. But you also have to be able, have the ability to change those institutions. Uh, people do have power, it's just not organized and focused. Um, um, and people don't vote because they don't see that making much of a difference. Uh, let me just express my frustration, not with the two of you, but with the situation. Uh, you know, I feel like the demands again and again are anemic, to be blunt. That when it comes to the extent of the catastrophe that's facing black America, our demands by and large are anemic. And I'm trying to figure out, is it like, is it just me? Am I just becoming old and even more radical or what? Right? That's what I'm trying to grapple with. Yeah, I mean, I think that the general problem, in response to your question about um, you know, people's, our, our people's demands being anemic, I think that the general problem is that black people do not understand racism, white supremacy, what it is and how it works. And so when you don't understand how structural systems of oppression work, then you, your demands reflect that. So people talking about, you know, we demand that, you know, the police force stop killing black people. Or, you know, it's like, okay, well, but do you know what the Law Enforcement Bill of Rights is? Do you know what public policies have been put in place over around the United States that justifies police killings? Because to me, Point. it doesn't mean that six structures are broken. It means they are operating as designed. And so when you, when you understand systems and how they are designed, then you, your demands can reflect that. Because I know here in, here in Maryland in particular, we, had, we were in Annapolis advocating to at least amend the Law Enforcement Bill of Rights, which is a document, which is a, a law that was put in place in the 70s that justified them withholding information about the Freddie Gray case for at least a week or 10 days. And so, but to me, that's like, that's a structural thing. That is not, and that's, and that's a very simple demand on a structure, but they weren't trying to amend that law. And then when Freddie Gray was killed, people saw how it applied. And so to me, that's what people need to put their focus at, is that what demands can we give that will demand transformation of structures and institutions? Because those are the things that are long lasting. And I think we, we get so caught up in the personality of the Black Lives Matter stuff, and, you know, justice for whoever is killed by police this week, right. you know, that we don't focus on what are these structures, the institutions, the things that are guiding these individual, these individual people to commit these acts of brutality. So to me, if we understand how white supremacy works on, on those ends, then we can actually transform how this country works. But if we don't, then we're going to be focusing on justice for whoever, send whoever to jail, instead of focusing on the writ large institutional structures that justify it in the first place. And we'll have to leave it at that. But thank you very much, Adam Jackson, Robert Moore. Thanks very much for joining us for The Global African. Thank you. And thanks for joining us for this episode of The Global African. I'm your host, Bill Fletcher. And we'll see you next time. Take care.